ഹസനീം <tries> لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة الحسنة رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم أرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا الطباء وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابا آمين يا رب العالمين Today I want to talk about raising compassionate kids How do we and why is it important that our kids have compassion in them and how do we raise kids that would have compassion in them i want to start off by saying something that i want to probably repeat this statement two three times that if your kids and yourself and what i'm talking about today doesn't apply only to kids it applies to all human beings and all relationships but i want to talk particularly from the perspective of little kids uh if you do not manage your emotions well if you don't imagine it manage your emotions well if you lack emotional intelligence then you will be not able to have compassion for others and if you're not able to have compassion for others that means what's the reason for that you don't have a trusting relationship with others in general and if you don't have a trusting relationship with others in general it means that that again you don't have an emotional relationship with others so i want to talk about this a little bit because i think it's an extremely important topic especially for muslim kids because of the type of pressures because of the type of environment the things that they deal with it's extremely important to talk about this so that you can have those necessary conversations with your kids that sometimes we don't as parents because we assume a lot of things one of the big problems of the modern world and i i'm very serious about this one of the big problems of the modern world is something we call atomization which is that everything is left to its for example parents don't teach their children why because the teachers teach their children everybody is in a function whereas parents have to remember they they play all functions they can never actually ultimately hand out any function to anyone you can't assume sunday school will teach your kids islam you can't assume that You can't assume that kids are going to get an education at school. You have to teach them something too. So they have that relationship with you. You have to teach them something about Islam too so that they have a relationship with you. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam especially showed there's a hadith in Sahih Muslim, a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that I have never seen anyone show more compassion to the kids than the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And I'm going to be talking about this, but I want to talk about some of the the aspects of emotional intelligence that are very very important um the first thing i want to talk about is that <clears throat> you might have noticed that um in in the 20th century it's very important to keep this in mind a lot of times a lot of times parents will demonstrate something for their kids for example let's say you open the door for somebody to come in and you're assuming your kids there and he's learning manners of how to open the door and let kids in doesn't happen like that anymore those days are gone if you, if guests come to your house and you're doing a really good job in treating your guests well and you're thinking oh my kids are watching how i'm doing kiram kiram al dayf uh uh respecting the guests i'm i'm teach they're watching me do this they're learning how to respect the guests it's not happening you know why because our kids are too distracted to be thinking about what you're really doing they're not learning the lessons that you want to teach them by them it is extremely important and this is the point one of the major points i wanted to make is that it's extremely important you actually have the conversations it's not important it, i mean it's not enough to just demonstrate but beyond demonstration you have to bring their awareness and bring their attention to what you are doing and why you were doing what you were doing if you don't do that the the kids are not going to notice you opened the door to somebody or that you were smiling to somebody or that you were being patient with someone they're not going to notice that and it is very important that you as parents bring up those conversations that not only you demonstrated but you're able to talk about it 
that you know, and you have to be able to talk about your own feelings, your own vulnerabilities. Like, have you ever had a, a conversation with your son, with your daughter, about when you were angry? What did you do? Right? Where you? What did you do when you were stressed? What did you do when you were in difficult times? Right? If you never had those conversations, who's teaching this to your kids? Then, then they're going to learn how to vent how to be angry, how to deal with stress, how to deal with difficult situations from their friends and other people. It's very important that you not only demonstrate, but have those conversations about emotions. You know what's so interesting about the Qur'an? The Qur'an is a religious scripture, and it's a religious book. But Allah created human beings, and Allah knows human beings. Allah understands human beings, and therefore there is no book guaranteed in the entire world there is no book, no book scripturally or any book, even in psychology. Even in psychology. And you know my domain of study is psychology, and I can say this pretty well. There's no book in the field of psychology or in the religious texts or any other human book that talks about emotional conditions of the human beings than the Quran. No other book. You, you take any emotion, like for example, even the emotions that we have, and I've talked about this before, even the emotions that we recently discovered, like these were never known as emotions there in Quran. For example, gratitude, shukr, thankfulness. When you do good to somebody, the other person feels like that's an emotion, that's a feeling that you get. If somebody does something good to you, you feel like, I want to do something good back to them. And the word shukr is there in the Qur'an 1,400 years ago, and they just made the Institute of Study of Gratitude in Canada maybe like 10 years ago, and which has become a big thing in psychology, in, in, in a field within psychology called positive psychology. They study gratitude. How, how, do, how do you become... But the point I'm trying to make is there's no book that talks about human emotions m more and is more vividly clear of human, human emotions than the Qur'an. I mean, even the word fear, just take a simple word. There's so many different words in Qur'an for fear. Like there's khushur, right? Alladhina hum fi salatim khashi'un, those who have khushur in their prayer. Then there's the word khawf, which is a negative fear. And there was only a book written recently called The Gift of Fear, which talks the positive aspects of fear. This book was written less than 10 years ago. The Gift of Fear, the positive aspect of fear, which Qur'an distinguishes between negative fear, which is khawf, and positive fear, which is khushur. This is the book of Allah. It knows human beings so well. And so it's very, very important that you, just like the Qur'an, develop a relationship with... You can actually use Qur'an to develop an emotional relationship with your kids. I'll give you an example. You know, in, it's so interesting. In psychology, there's something called bibliotherapy. Bibliotherapy. So interesting. Just listen to what I'm about to say. The Quran gives us stories, right? And stories are great for kids. And not only that, but the Quran doesn't give us every detail. I'll give you an example. Yusuf is there, and that lady she shuts the door of Allah Talba, right? She shuts the door, and Yusuf is there. You can you now fill in the gaps in your mind because the Quran doesn't give you the blanks. Sometimes you fill in the gaps of how Yusuf was feeling at that time, at that moment, based upon your own experiences. Now, if somebody has reached puberty and stuff, he would know that Yusuf maybe felt tempted. But if it's maybe somebody younger, he might be thinking Yusuf was shy. Maybe he was angry. Maybe he was upset. He, so we take story, and, and you know what they do in bibliotherapy? They have you read a book, and they ask you, how was this character feeling? And what you do is, if you, if for example, you went through divorce, and this book is about someone who went through divorce, and now that person that went through divorce, there now let's say if I went through divorce, they're asking me, the therapist is asking me, what did you, instead of saying how I feel, they're saying, what do you feel about this person that was going through divorce in this story? And what will happen is I will project, I will self-project my feelings onto that person that was going through a similar situation as me. You follow what I'm saying? The same thing in Qur'an. When you talk about Adam eating the forbidden tree, every one of us has been in that state of shame, right? Uh, where we did something we didn't want. Every one of us has experienced Adam, right? Every one of us has found out, especially those of us that are good, which means most people in this masjid, 
uh, those of us that are good, when we try to do bad, we somehow get caught. Like Adam got caught, right? And then he got shamed. And then you repent. And then you're like, oh, you know, maybe Allah doesn't want me to do this. How many times this has happened in your lives? So stories with kids are very, you know, the Quranic stories are very emotional. Like when you read the Bible, there's no emotional stories in the Bible. Not putting the Bible down, but I'm saying as a general statement, the only part of the Bible that has an emotionally charged story is the chapter of Job, which is Ayub alayhi salatu salam. Remember he was sick and he had that disease and so on and so forth. But the Quran is a book full of emotions, full of human tragedy, full of human desire, and talking about pride and ego and, and both the positive side of man as well as the negative side of it. Somebody can be like Fir'aun, right? You can have a discussion with your child about the stories of Qur'an. Talk about Fir'aun. And talk about how Fir'aun, in the Qur'an, that there's so many Fir'auns out there in the real world. And that some of our children may be affected by these Fir'auns of the real world. But it is very, very, very important. And I was just, one of the great ways, and no one has ever done this, I would really like to do this, if Allah ever gave me a chance, is not talk about just the lives of the prophets, meaning the life of Adam, the life of Nuh, but to ask those emotional, emotionally charged questions. How do you think Nuh felt at this point? How do you think he felt when he was making a boat in the middle of a desert and everyone's laughing at him, that <laughs> this crazy man, he's building a boat, right? And then asking the kids, have you ever been in that situation? Have you ever been in a situation where everyone's making fun of you in the classroom? Have you been in that situation? You can use the stories of Qur'an to, to really help children understand their own emotions and their own uh, internal conflicts, right? Because if you can't manage your emotions well, then you can't respect others because you're, you're in a conflict. When you're in a conflict internally, how can you respect the parents? When you're, an emotional, you're emotionally drained and you can't have emotional management properly, how are you going to empathize with other people? When you're, like, when you're hurt yourself, you don't care about other people. When you're confused yourself, you can't help other people. How are you going to deal with conflicts in relationships with your boss, with your wife, with your husband, in, in, in your life? Who are the people? You're not going to learn this in school, how to deal with emotions. You're not going to learn this in school. They don't, they don't teach this in chemistry. They don't teach this in math. The parents have to teach this. The parents have to teach this through Qur'an. They can teach this through their own experiences. You know, that day I was really stressed. This is how I handled the situation. That day I was under such and such situation. And you have to not only demonstrate it, but you have to talk about how do you deal with these conflicts. And especially Muslims who are going to end up in conflicts, maybe even with outsiders, someday. someday. We may be, uh, you have to have conversations with your kids. What would you do one day if somebody is racist against you as a Muslim? What would you do? Did you ever sit down and talk to them? That, you know, if it happens, you should call CARE, or you should come tell me, then we can call CARE. CARE is an organization that I'm sure you're all aware of, Council of American Islamic Relations. Have you ever talked to them about these things about, have you sat down? You know, if your kids, when you talk to them and your relationship is basically two things, a checklist, did you do this? Did you not do this? Did you do your homework? Did you not do your homework? That's not a relationship, right? And if the children give you one word answers, honk, yeah. That's it? Yeah, I did it. No. If your relationship with your kid is one word answers or the smallest sentence construction that they could think of to give you an answer and then go to their room, you don't have a relationship with your kids. You need to talk about things, even like things like, you know, son, how do you feel? There's a prom in your school. There's a prom in your school and everyone's, you know, there's all these guys are going to be going out with girls. How do you feel about that? Or daughter, how do you feel about that? Did you ever say this to your, talk to your kids about this? Did you ever talk to your kids about, hey, how many friends do you know that take drugs? Did you ever talk to them about this? How easy is it for you to get drugs in school? Did you ever talk to them about this? Did you ever talk to them about having girlfriends? Or even, even, have you ever been backstabbed by a friend? Can you relate to them an experience of yours when you were backstabbed by your friends? How you felt? And then they can relate with that and say, okay, this happens in life. How do you help your children choose good friends? These are... Who's going to have, teachers don't have these conversations. 
Sunday school teachers, generally speaking, don't have these conversations. Who's going to talk about these things? How are you going to impart your experience, your legacy, your feelings to your kids unless you have these conversations? You know, inshallah, uh, I don't have too much time, but inshallah in the second khutbah, I want to talk about the Prophet ﷺ and things that relate to this sallallahu how the Prophet was with kids. I mean, it's just amazing. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَسْوَلَ Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah, you will find the best of examples, including, and it's just amazing, because there's nothing you can look at except you find the Prophet being an example for that, at, at like such a, such a high level that, that you can't even imagine, right? And so, it is very, very important that you all have to go back home, and you have to have these, begin to have these conversations with your kids. You know, it's very, very important that, uh, that... So let's talk about what the Prophet, how the Prophet dealt with this, and then we'll continue. ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالحق بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساء من يدع الله ورسوله فقد رشد ومن يعصه ما فلا يضب إلا نفسه ما بعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة the Prophet وسلم, when there's a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, I believe, that when the Prophet would be going by, and any time he saw little kids, he would make sure he would go out of his way to say assalamu alaikum to them. Every single kid. Every single kid. Right? The Prophet وسلم, you know this, but think about the impact. You've heard this, but I want you to think about the impact. When the Prophet وسلم, would be praying and he would hear the cries of little child, what would he do? But think about what that society was thinking. Oh, did you see that? The Prophet shortened his prayers because of that kid that was crying. Right? That was teaching everyone in that, that was teaching the companions of the Prophet how to behave towards kids. Right? A man saw the Prophet because it was, you know, some of these cons- things were considered, are you, like, uh, uh, not acceptable, or a kind of like a defect in your character if you did certain things, like kiss your children. Right? And so once the Prophet ﷺ kissed, kissed a child, and one person said, I have ten kids, I've never kissed any of them. Right? And the Prophet said, what can you do with someone who's devoid of mercy? Right? So the Prophet demonstrated in a society that thought these things were Ayyub. He would kiss Hassan and Hussein all the time. He would kiss Usama bin Zayd. Once, you know, he would play with uh, Hassan. He, Hassan was old. These were the two older. Hussein wasn't there yet. Uh, or he was too young. He put Usama bin Zayd. Remember Usama bin Zayd? That's the son of Usama. The person the Prophet raised on one lap. And Hussein, uh, Hassan on the other lap. And play with them. And it said, Umar Salma had a daughter. This is in the Sahih Hadith. Umar Salma had a daughter named Zainab. Right? The Prophet would re- play with her until she got tired. Repeatedly play with her. Once the Prophet ﷺ saw a little girl with a yellow shirt. With a yellow shirt. And you know the parents are very careful. And by the way, this would be interesting for you. A lot of times you've noticed this. Many of you parents have noticed this, I'm sure. Is that when you talk to the teacher, they're like, Oh, he's really well behaved. Or she's really well behaved. And you're like, what are you talking about? They're not behaved in my house. Right? And, and they surprise you. The, one of the reasons kids are not behaved at home is because they're emotionally spending themselves outside. And when they come home, they just want to be themselves. They want to relax. Just like when you go out and work. The guys know this. When you go out and work all day, you want to come home and you just want to relax. Right? You don't want to be necessarily on the best of your... You can't because you're emotionally spent necessarily be on the best of your emotions. So, a lot of times, your kids are doing okay, but you still need to tell them there are still, you know, lines you need to draw when you're at home still. The other thing that I've noticed is that every time there's a conflict between siblings, uh, the uh, brother and sister are fighting, or brother and brother are fighting, parents want to interject. 
and like solve the problem for them. It's not necessary. If you want them to learn how to imagine, emotionally manage their themselves, how to emotionally manage their own emotions, which means ultimately how you're going to deal with other people, you have to let them fight. You have to let them argue with each other. You have to let them sort out their differences amongst themselves. It's not necessary that whenever there's a conflict between siblings, you jump in and try to solve the problem. Or tell one person, you go here and then you go to the other way. That's what my dad used to say. Yeah, my dad would be like, okay, where you go to this room, Amna, my sister, younger sister, you go to that room, that's it. You know, you're both wrong. Boom. That's what happened sometimes. But anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that sometimes it's okay to let your siblings fight with each other. It's not necessary for you as parents because you have to train your kids for the real world. And in the real world, they're going to have conflicts. They're going to have issues with other people. How are you going to... How, how, how are you... Again, you need to have these conversations. When one sibling is feeling down because of another sibling, they have to learn how to manage that relationship. They have to learn how to manage that. So it's very, very important that you sit down with your kids every day. And, and you don't have to do it directly. The great thing about emotional development is that it can be done as side conversations. And you're not talking about them. You can talk about yourself. You know, one day I was feeling stressed. So it's not a direct teaching, per se, but it's side conversation. You're going in the car and you're talking about yourself, right? If you, and, and you will help them deal with their emotions at a much more deeper level. It's very, very important that you sit down and have these emotionally charged conversations about marriage. Have you ever asked your child about what age do you want to get married in? What type of girl do you want to marry? What type of guy do you want to marry? Right? Have you ever had these conversations with them? Because if you haven't, then you're losing out on a real authentic relationship. You're losing out on a real authentic relationship. And so, the other thing I wanted to talk about was... Uh, <coughs> This is very important. Helping children manage their emotions also means that helping them manage their image and their understanding and their identity as Muslims. Did you ever sit down with your kids and talk about Syria? Show them the pic poor pictures of the poor people, right? Uh, I know a lot of people in this masjid and other masjids, what they do is after Jummah khutbah is finished, they'll give one or two dollars to their kids and they'll put it in the donation box, that's good. But beyond that, you must have that discussion. I told you, kids don't learn by just demonstration. You have to have that discussion. I gave you this one dollar because we're giving it to poor people, or we're giving it to this cause. And you, it's a good idea to go to the internet and show them poor Muslims in Syria. It's a good idea to show them what's happening in Lebanon. It's a good idea to show them what's... Give them a sense of belonging, a sense of identity with the whole Muslim world. That we belong to this Muslim world, but we're going through difficult times. If you don't clarify this for them, they're going to be in an identity crisis. They're, 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 they're not going to be able to relate to a lot of issues. You have to create that political awareness. And political awareness is very, very, very important part, part of your identity. Your identity as a Muslim, your identity as an Ummah. When will you, how will you give that to the child? How will you give the, to the child that Muslims in Syria are suffering? You need to share with them. Muslims in Yemen are suffering, you need to share with them. How are you going to create this feeling in them? Unless you're sitting down and talking to them. Parents have a lot of work to do. And if, if you, think of the opposite of what I'm saying. If you don't have these conversations, then someone else is telling them. And they're distracted. They're in ghafla. They don't even know what's going on in the world. They don't even know what to, how to Islamically think about what's happening in the world. They won't even have an idea. They will lose their identity. I mean, they will not be able to understand what's happening in the world, how it relates to Muslims. And the only thing then, what happens is kids go to school, and, you know, they're interested in their careers, and they go to their careers, and they become whatever they become computer scientists or engineers or doctors, whatever they become. And this is the other thing that's happening, by the way. It's, it's a big crisis in the Muslim world. 
Um, I'm going to talk about this and end by two more things, and then inshallah we will pray. Um, number one, uh, it is extremely important that you talk to your kids about marriage. Because what's happening, especially the sisters, I want the sisters to listen to this. We have two trends in America. In America, we have two trends. We have the trend that people get married early in their MSA years. And we have a trend that people that are more educated, they don't get married till their 30s and 40s now. This is happening in the Muslim world. The average Muslim girl is now getting married, not in her 20s. The average Muslim girl is now getting married in his 30s and 40s. Because what happens? You're so busy in school, and you're, then after school, you're so busy at work, and every, everyone around you is probably not people you're going to marry because they're of a different group. And so you're busy in that world of yours, building your career and, and all that, and then education takes over, and then career takes over, and you're missing out on marriage. And, and so you need to have that understanding with your child. When would you like to start the process of getting married? It's a good idea to get married, Islamically speaking, as soon as possible. However, I have to caution you that because our maturity level is a little bit slow, meaning in other words, people that are 20 years old are less mature than people that were 20 years old 20 years ago. Or they're less mature than people that were of the same age, especially boys. So you know, you need to figure out how marriage is going to work. But you need to have these conversations with your kids. And you need to talk about Islam. You need to talk about the Muslim world. Uh, the two things I want to end with, that, uh, number one, two brothers promised, uh, Sheikh Ahmad Yas, the last week, one brother promised 5,000, one brother promised 3,000. If you could just come to me, because we don't know who you are. Those of you who promised, please fulfill your promise and let me know who you are, because he's having a hard time finding those two people, number one. And the second thing is, there's a brother who needs sponsorship for his children to bring them from Egypt to here. He's a big part of our community, helps us in Sunday school. If you can come and approach me regarding that. Let's, inshallah, finish with dua. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirat hasana wa kina adhab inna Rabbana ghulamna al-fusna wa illa mtafillana wa tarhamna wa nakunna min al-khasirin Oh Allah, give us a outstanding relationship with our kids. Help us build an emotional relationship with them that we can guide them. Uh, that they would come to us for advice. That they would come to us to understand how to make choices in life. And uh, help us demonstrate and, and build that relationship with them, inshallah. Allahumma amin ya rabbal alameen. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama salli ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna ka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barik ala Ibrahim. Before I finish, I want to mention this. It's very, very important. Very, 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 very important. How you treat your daughters people don't realize the importance of this. How a father treats his daughters is how she will expect her spouse to treat her. If the father is extremely nice to his daughter, then her standards of how to be treated by men goes up. If a daughter is treated badly by her, by her father, then her standard of what she, accept, she accepts as acceptable behavior towards her goes up. Down. And how did the Prophet treat his daughters? He had only daughters that lived. We know how he treated his daughters, right? He would, he would see Fatima and walk up, walk up to her and kiss her hands. Put her, make her sit where she was sitting. Make her sit where she was sitting. This is how the Prophet treated his daughters. And many stories like this about the Prophet. Of course, we don't have time right now. But it is extremely important. If you have daughters, you treat them with the with the respect, because the respect you give them is the respect that they're going to expect from the other men in their relationships in, in, in life to come. Inshallah, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa kina adhaf anna Rabbana adhalamna nafsna wa ilam taqfir lana wa tarhamna lana kina min khazirin Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kima salli ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim inna fahmidu majid Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kima barik ta'ala Ibrahim 
وعلى اله وبركاته ان الحميد مجيد ان الله يعمركم بالعدل والاحسان وايتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله يذكركم فاستجبوا لكم باقي الصلاه